London's decision to place the Sea Venom missile aboard its AW-159 Wildcat helicopters marks more than a routine refresh of fleet ordnance, it is a doctrinal statement about how the United Kingdom intends to fight for sea control in crowded, contested theaters. A lightweight, high subsonic weapon with an imaging infrared seeker and optional man-in-the-loop datalink, Sea Venom restores a helicopter-launched standoff anti-ship punch that Britain last wielded with Sea Skewer, but it does so with far greater discrimination, survivability, and flexibility. The result is a sharpened tool for coercion and deterrence at sea, precisely the kind of capability that a navy operating daily in the Baltic, North Atlantic, and Indo-Pacific requires. The operational logic is straightforward. Ships are getting better at killing other ships at long range, but keeping fast, agile rotary wing aircraft on the edge of a task group screen adds a mobile, unpredictable firing point that complicates an opponent's calculus. By pushing sea venom out beyond 20 kilometers, the Wildcat can stalk patrol craft, missile boats, and corvettes without crossing into the densest threat envelopes, while the host ship remains further back with its powerful sensors and layer defenses. That geometry, small helicopter forward, big combatant behind, lets the Royal Navy probe, identify, and if necessary strike without exposing its capital units. It also compresses the time from detection to effects, a crucial advantage against fast surface contacts that can appear, fire, and disappear amid coastal clutter. Sea Venom's technology stack is aimed squarely at the murky middle, where navies now wrestle, congested shipping lanes, gray zone encounters, and electronically noisy littorals. Imaging infrared guidance confers resilience against jamming and decoys that bedevil radar-guided weapons, while the datalink returns agency to human operators when legal or political risk spikes. Live video and aim point selection in terminal flight are not mere conveniences, they are governance features. They allow air crews to abort when a fisherman drifts into the scene, discriminate between military and civilian hulls in a ferry lane, or shift impact toward a ship sensors and engines rather than the crew spaces. In an era when maritime incidents can escalate at the speed of a viral clip, such control is strategic. Payload and kinematics matter, too. A 30-kilogram blast fragmentation warhead is not a ship killer in the way that a heavy anti-ship missile might be, but it is purpose-built to disable the kind of light and medium combatants that increasingly police contested seas. Penetration followed by internal detonation can blind radar, sever communications, and stall propulsion, taking a threat out of the fight without sinking it, often the more desirable outcome when the objective is to de-escalate after demonstrating resolve. If a target is tougher, ripple firing multiple missiles from one or more wildcats overwhelms point defenses and allows selective dismantling of a vessel's eyes, ears, and legs. Integration on the wildcat is central to the concept. Leonardo's Sea Spray AESA radar gives the helicopter a long, precise look into the maritime picture, cueing sea venom shots while the aircraft flies nap of the sea to minimize exposure. The Wildcat can mix its loadout, pairing Sea Venom with the lighter Martlet missile to cover swarms of small craft at short range and heavier threats at distance. That complementary pairing delivers a continuous engagement ladder from point blank to beyond 20 kilometers, all from a single, ship-borne helicopter detachment. The effect is not just firepower, it is bargaining power. A destroyer backed by Wildcats can board, shadow, or warn with confidence that a calibrated strike option exists if the situation deteriorates. The program's Franco-British roots matter for more than industrial politics. Shared development under the FASGW framework, and France's planned deployment of the missile on NH-90 and Panther helicopters, sets conditions for common training, tactics, and logistics inside NATO. When Allied navies rotate through carrier strike groups or form ad hoc coalitions for sanctions enforcement and freedom of navigation patrols, interoperable helicopter weapons shrink friction. A missile that speaks across platforms and nations is a quiet accelerant for combined maritime power, especially in theaters where European presence is rising and partners must operate seamlessly amid U.S. and regional forces. Strategically, Sea Venom supports a broader shift toward distributed lethality. 
Instead of concentrating offensive punch solely in frigates and destroyers, the Royal Navy is spreading effects across embarked air wings. That distribution complicates an adversary's targeting problem, there are simply more launch nodes to track and suppress, and it reduces the risk that the loss or damage of a single ship will degrade the group's striking options. It also aligns with Britain's growing pattern of presence operations, in which ships spend long periods signaling commitment inside contested regions without crossing escalation thresholds. A helicopter that can quietly hold multiple surface craft at risk while the mothership stays over the horizon is an ideal instrument for such signaling. There are, of course, counter moves. Opponents will invest in better short range air defenses, multispectral obscurance, and deceptive heat signatures to frustrate imaging seekers. They will proliferate micro UAV pickets to catch helicopters popping up to fire, and they will try to saturate the electromagnetic environment to degrade data links. Yet Sea Venom's architecture is a hedge against precisely those adaptations, autonomy when links are cut, human judgment when environments are crowded, and enough standoff range and speed to reduce exposure windows. Moreover, because the missile's effects can be tailored, aiming for sensors rather than crew, for example, it remains useful even as adversaries shift from open aggression to lawfare and paramilitary harassment. The weapon's utility extends ashore. While optimized for ships, a steerable, precise, low-collateral missile is well suited to suppress mobile coastal radar, shore-based anti-ship launchers, and command nodes that anchor maritime exclusion schemes. In amphibious cover or crisis response, that means a wildcat can tidy up the edges of a landing lane or neutralize a threatening battery tucked into a harbor mouth without leveling nearby infrastructure. The political value of calibrated, surgical, effects in a coastal city cannot be overstated, they keep options on the table when coalition partners are wary of civilian harm and local authorities demand restraint. From a readiness perspective, sea venom is timely. The Royal Navy's carriers, destroyers, and frigates are again spending long stretches at sea with embarked wildcats, and the ability to generate effects from the air while preserving the hull is a maintenance virtue as much as a tactical one. Fewer high-risk ship maneuvers, fewer hours sprinting into threat envelopes, more engagements conducted by helicopter, these are marginal gains that add up over months of deployment. Training pipelines also benefit from the missile's feedback loop, Crews who can watch their weapons terminal scene learn faster and refine tactics in a way that paper simulations seldom match. Finally, Sea Venom embodies a pragmatic approach to maritime coercion, put a smart, networked, right-sized weapon in the hands of a crew that can think at the edge. It is not the heaviest missile, the longest-legged, or the loudest announcement. But it changes behavior. Patrol craft that once felt safe skirting a task group's perimeter will keep their distance. Corvettes that relied on coastal clutter for sanctuary will be less bold. Commanders managing tense intercepts will have a credible, precise option between a radio call and a torpedo. In that space, where daily frictions decide who enjoys initiative, Britain's rearmed wildcats confer a quiet but decisive advantage. Taken together, the fielding of sea venom is less about novelty than about relevance. It reflects a navy adapting to a world where the decisive engagements are short, complex, and filmed from three angles, where the most meaningful victories are those that prevent wider war, and where the ability to disable rather than destroy often delivers the strategic effect that matters. The missile gives the Royal Navy a measured, modern way to impose outcomes at sea, and in the uneasy waters of today's security landscape, that is the kind of power that truly counts.